Previously, she taught at Durham University and at the LSE, where she completed her PhD in 2017. She's worked in the US in the public sector and for international NGOs like Care International. And as I've noted, her research centers on environmental history and politics, historical international relations, international hierarchies and orders, and the development of these very first early international organizations, like she explores in the Ideal River. Her next project, and we're going to talk about both the recently published book as well as the next project, looks at the history of Antarctica and early outer space exploration. So in today's panel, I'm going to do something a bit different potentially from how some of the other sessions may be. I want to ask a series of about four or five questions about the contributions of this book and how she come to, came to write it and about the new project and then open the floor to you. So it's as engaging and interactive as possible. And last year, we had quite a lot of interest from students about what it's like to actually write a book. How do you sit down? How do you start? How do you know the idea is big enough to write an entire book on something random that you've read? So this is a bit has informed my line of questioning because previous students were really interested in these questions. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to sit down now. So I'm at the same level. Is the is the mic? Okay, that one. Yep. Just checking the sound quality you can hear in the back. Yeah, great. All right. So great to have read. And I would highly recommend any of you um, who haven't come across it to check it out. It is in the library, the Ideal River. Um, now, just a note for all of you studying here that the Ideal River, I think, is super interesting both for EU politics because it tells us a lot about the Rhine, which was one of the key reasons that we even got the European Union. It's also important, as you note in the book, for international commerce and trade and understanding economics, because it was tamed to liberalize and to enable trade uh, to, to occur across these, what were then highways. There were no motorways then. And it's also important around international order. But when you started this book, you probably hadn't teased out all of those arguments. So where did you get the idea to research three kind of historic, bizarre, not particularly well-known river commissions? Okay, thank, thank you so much. Can, can everyone hear me? It's working, excellent. And it's great to see so many students here um, on the first day, first day, first week, first yes. day. Um, and I hope you're all having a good time so far uh, and continue to have a good time as the year progresses. Uh, as Nina mentioned, I am um alumni alum. Is that the right oh, alumnus? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of of Sice Bologna. Um and I remember my time here fondly, very fondly. I think I, I did count on my fingers. I think it's 16 years ago that I was here. So so a long time ago. Um, but uh, as I was reflecting today, not a lot has changed, you know, especially at least with the building layouts and and sort of uh, Julio's bar and everything. So all of those things were here 16 years ago. And the good ice cream is still around I, the corner. The good ice cream is still around the corner. So that ha also has not changed. To, um, <laughs> you know, I'm very happy that hasn't changed, actually. Um, so, yes, go, going back to the question of um, how did I start on this book? Um, what, what, how did I find these three rivers and these three river commissions? So I, when I started my PhD, I actually wanted to do something completely different. And this this is quite typical of PhD students I, I found in my experience. Uh, what I really wanted to do research on were oceans. Um, and what I was interested in doing from the beginning was um, investigating norms governing oceans and was particularly interested in what I conceptualize as negative norms. So the long historical perspective leading to environmental degradation um, and sort of lack of care of oceans. So that was kind of my original idea. Um, when I f got to my PhD program, my supervisor kind of took a look at this project and said, oceans are way too big. You're never gonna finish this project in the three, four years you're allocated. You need to think smaller. Um, if you think about oceans, think about how many states you'd have to investigate to kind of see the, the cooperation and conflict over oceans. You'd have to investigate pretty much all of them. And you just don't have time in the four years to investigate, you know, 100 states and what they were saying in oceans. Um, so he advised me to look at something smaller. And he said, well, what about rivers? 
Um, and he had heard about the Danube Commission uh, in discussions in the early 20th century. And uh, the Danube Commission has come up uh, as sort of a prototype that might be used if we're thinking about international government. So in the early uh, 20th century, a lot of international thinkers, international liberal thinkers, were really considering um, if we could create an international government, what would it have to look like? Uh, and the Danube Commission came up. Uh, and so he suggested I follow this lead. Um, and as I was doing research, I discovered that not a lot had been written about it. It's interesting that it comes up and then it disappears and not had uh, not much has been written about it. And then there's a precursor to the Danube Commission, the Rhine Commission, but not really much had been written about that, especially in international relations. Um, so, you know, I've kept on following up on these strands um, and I discovered quite a lot of work had been written on uh, transboundary rivers, so rivers that go across state borders and sort of how then the states had to negotiate to kind of cooperate or, or fight over these, these sort of resources. Um, but the focus had always been on cooperation versus conflict, as these two sort of dichotomous things to look at, which I think is important. But I began to become more interested in sort of a deeper and broader history or um, the deeper and broader story of these rivers and what rivers mean, right? What were the actors thinking they were cooperating over? What did the river mean to these actors? And I think we had to understand that before you can really understand cooperation or conflict or what cooperation and conflict meant. Um, so then I thought, well, I have what, what I need to do is really to dig into the longer history of what these rivers meant. And that's how I, I guess, arrived at this project. Which leads me to the next question. Your work is based on very uh, wonderfully thick descriptions, not just of like diplomatic history, but also cultural history. It's archival. You've had to go away and squirrel away probably in lots of different places turning up um, all sorts of old documents. But how do you do this? If you say, I want to study the Danube and the, the the Rhine and the Congo, how do you know where to look? And what does archival research look like when you're studying a river? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, so I, I guess I started the project with the diplomatic. So I think that's the, probably the most successful bit. If we're interested in looking at the first international organizations, then we need to go into the archival records and see how they were created, why they were created. What were the diplomats saying when they got together and signed this piece of paper that created these commissions? Um, and you know, when I was looking at these, it was a bit hard going because the sort of diplomatic moments I was looking at, if you think about the 1815 Congress of Vienna, you think about the 1856 um, Paris Peace Conference, a lot were going on at these conferences. These were major European conferences after major European conflicts where they were trying to put basically European uh, international order back together again. So there was so much else going on. So teasing out the bits about the river was actually really difficult and there wasn't you know, always a lot there. Um, it kind of felt like, you know, these issues were sidelined. Um, and I think it was only when I was able to think about these commissions, not as just sort of technocratic or bureaucratic footnotes to these commissions, but to connect them uh, to the larger social and intellectual forces at the time um, that their sort of unspoken importance came into focus, at least for me. Um, and finding the link between the two, between sort of what was going on in the diplomatic negotiations, the high politics of international relations, if you will, um, and sort of the, the the broader intellectual and social forces. If you think about the 19th century, um, there was romanticism, there was what was um, called the second scientific um, enlightenment going on. So there were quite a lot of social forces going on. If you think about the Napoleonic Wars and what that did for nationalism, all of these forces were going on. So how do you then connect to some um, what you find in the archival records, which can be quite tedious, can be quite technical, to these sort of larger stories of what people were doing in societies? Um, and you know, I found it a bit hard going in that there's not always a lot of direct evidence where you know, some diplomats sit down and said, oh, I read this romantic poetry or I saw this piece of art and it made me think, oh, maybe we should do this to rivers. So you're not going to find that sort of uh, evidence in, in the archives. Um, and I think I, I, I hit a breakthrough when I was actually talking to a visiting historian 
um, in London. Uh, and I was saying, oh, I'm having difficulty sort of linking these two bodies of evidence, the diplomatics and sort of these broader um, social and intellectual movements, which I, I thought was really interesting and important for the way we think about the river. And she said to me, um, you didn't need the direct evidence uh, that it's impossible to think of diplomats as just robots who are sealed off from the broader intellectual forces that are going on around them. Of course, they're human beings. Of course, they would have um, been soaked in the intellectual undercurrents at the time. Uh, and I think for me, that was a real uh, turning point to, to say, OK, even if you're not going to find that direct link in the archival um, records to be to be able to then theorize, well, these are people. They're situated. They had friends. They went out to the theaters. You know, they had social lives after they signed off for the day in their diplomatic conferences. So lots of things were going on. And of course, they were picking up on some of these intell intellectual forces. And so that's how I was able to connect the two. And what did the diplomats want to do by taming the river? What was the point of the river commissions? And why is that important for international order more generally? Yes. So with the river commissions, um, I guess rivers, the ideal river. The book is titled The Ideal River. What is the ideal river? So in my conceptualization of the ideal of the river, the ideal river is imagined. It's what is imagined in these diplomats' minds. And it is a highway, a frictionless highway that was going to take goods to market, that was going to take liberal ideas out into the periphery. Um, and that was going to be um, navigable both for, for, for commerce, but also for sort of the intellectual forces at the time. Uh, and it was important to create uh, this idealized river to turn real rivers, which if anybody has ever engaged with real rivers, they are not this imagined, straightened, frictionless force. Uh, rivers almost have lives of their own. They have sort of um, hydro hydrological corks that sometimes make them difficult to tame. Uh, but in creating these perfectly straightened uh, highways that would take goods to market, that would take your ideas out to the periphery. Um, it was important for the international order. Uh, in my book, I argue for three uh, reasons. One is state sovereignty. So a state was only seen as a good sovereign actor when it can control the resources within its territory. And one of those resources is the river um, as, as, as a highway, as a way of taking your goods to market, as a way of increasing your economic yield. Um, the second one is sort of an imperial hierarchy or international hierarchy that states judged each other, at least in sort of an early European international sense, states judged each other based on how well they contained the river. And if somebody wasn't doing their, a good job of making sure that the shipping went through the river in, in, a, in an efficient way, then other states looked down upon them and said, oh, they're not civilized. Um, and then finally, um, as I emphasize in my book, the creation of these first international organizations. So we can see, um, it depends, of course, it depends a bit on how you define international organizations, but um, if you kind of define them uh, as intergovernmental organizations that come together every now and then to discuss issues, um, and that has a body and a seat somewhere, um, then uh, the Rhine Commission can be conceived as the first of these international organizations. So I think it's very interesting that these rivers, the problem of governing, maintaining, straightening, and creating the ideal river really uh, set the groundwork for creating an international organization. And that is a pop question later on in IR theories, actually. What, what is the first IO? So any of you in the room will now know the answer. Um, one of the interesting things about the book is you focus on the Rhine, you know, the early 1815, I think, the Danube, which you say is actually the very first intergovernmental organization because the Rhine River Commission just has the neighboring or the riparian states that are part of it, whereas the Danube has states that aren't adjacent to the river. But then the third example you give was a big surprise. It was the Congo River Commission. So you went from the Rhine to the Danube to the Congo. And the diplomatic history here is fascinating because you end up in Berlin in the 1880s with states trying to negotiate something, but it fails. So we get a case, a failed case of trying to export something from Europe. So why did you include that in the story? Yeah, so I think 
Uh, that's interesting. And there are probably other cases I could have included um, in the story, but I actually stumbled on the Congo River Commission in the archives. Uh, so I was reading some correspondence on the Danube River Commission um, in the British archives, and there was this note from one of the British diplomats um, ahead of the Berlin Conference asking their members on the Danube Commission a bunch of questions about how it was organized, how did it work, how did they negotiate with all the different states, how did they keep their people in line? Um, and the aim of this letter was to supply the to to supply a model for the Congo. So taking the Danube com, um, Commission and saying, okay, how do we then apply this to the Congo? And so I thought that was really interesting. This is something I had never heard of. And for those of you who who do know about um, the Berlin Conference, um, you know, my previous knowledge of the conference had been kind of a very surface level. The traditional story of the conference was all about the partition of Africa and the development of ideas of terra nullius and going in and just slicing up Africa, right? Uh, and I had never heard of the Congo Commission as being part of the deal. But actually, if you, once you start looking in the history, the project at the Berlin Conference wasn't necessarily to divide up um, Africa per se. There was a concerted effort to create this neutral non-sovereign space, giant neutral non-sovereign space in the middle of Africa. And I thought it was a fascinating story to try to investigate why didn't that come into fruition? What happened? Um, and I think it was interesting for the book because first it took the, the story away from Europe. Um, and second, it um, really helped me delve into a colonial geographical imaginary. So what happens when these ideas that were indigenous to Europe, that were developed along European rivers, suddenly the Europeans say, oh, that was a good idea. Let's try to put it somewhere else. Let's try to export that. Um, and I think the failure is just really important here. Yeah. And why, why did it fail? Ah, why did it fail? Well, you'll have to read the book. I think it's a, <laughs> it's a good teaser. No, I think it's, it's, it's a complicated story of why it failed. But uh, I argue that maybe maybe we can think about it in two sort of different slices. Uh, one of the reasons why the, the Berlin Conference, I think, failed, and a lot of historians write it down as this abject failure, right, um, is that it was very inward looking. So it was really about Europe and European politics. So Africa was there, but it was kind of a token to inter-European politics. Um, and the second reason, a group of reasons, the ways of thinking about why it failed has to do with a conceptual emptiness they projected on Africa. So they 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 didn't think it was completely empty. They didn't think that, you know, they weren't dumb enough to think that there wasn't any people there or there wasn't even societies there. But in their conceptualizations, uh, the idea is that what was there was just not important. So what they thought was, well, if there's a conceptual emptiness of important institutions and important societies, so what we're gonna do is um, import something better and that will stick. So, so sort of there was an assumption of what was there and what can be done. Mm, it's really interesting and relates to this morning's discussion that some of you are part of about racial hierarchies and, and international relations. So I want to ask about your uh, current project to move on. Um, you're looking at outer space in Antarctica. Why, why is that so interesting for an international relations scholar to look at the early governance around outer space and Antarctica? Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. Why is it? Why is it? Um, well, I mean, there are different ways uh, of approaching this. I mean, obviously, I just think Antarctica is really fascinating, and so is outer space exploration. Um, but if you look at three agreements that happened in the mid-20th century, then uh, 1959 Antarctic Treaty System, uh, and then there is UNICLOS, which I don't actually involved in this uh, in this project because it's just one too many bodies. Um, and then the Outer Space Treaty in 67, I believe, 1967. Um, and they came kind of within a decade of each other, these agreements. Um, it's quite interesting that this was also a time of shift from sort of an imperial world to a state-centric world, right? So then something, my hunch is that something is happening that links sort of the conclusion of these, these treaties with sort of a shift from a, a colonial world to a post-colonial world. Uh, and my hunch is that science has something to do with the story. And how far have you gotten this research? I know you're in New Zealand and Australia. Were there any interesting findings there in, in that work? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I've done a, a bit more work on the Antarctic um, side and I think the ATS 
the Antarctic Treaty System, um, is just fascinating. So the, again, it, it's interesting in international relations, there's not a ton of things written about it. Um, there is a lot of things written about it in geography and sort of other disciplines, but not necessarily international relations. And when it is, um, you know, some some of the, the sources, it's just a footnote saying, this is an example of technocratic cooperation gone right at the height of the Cold War. You know, at the height of the Cold War, there are these two superpowers and they were at each other's throats. But here is proof that science can help us forge cooperation in international peace where power politics has failed. Um, but actually, if you look at the history, delve, delve deeper into the history of the ATS, um, it's, you know, the archives are rife with ex sort of exclusionary politics of what the ATS was about, full of descriptions of a certain set of colonial powers trying to keep the riffraff, and that's their, those are their words, riffraff, out. And these riffraff were both sort of uh, Eastern Bloc countries in their minds, in the, in the minds of these Western countries, uh, Eastern Bloc countries under the Soviets, and also sort of these newly independent countries. So they were still characterizing these countries as a riffraff. And there was a concerted effort with the ATS to keep these troublemakers or riffraff out. And they use science to do it. So if you look at the treaty, what it does is frame science as this gatekeeping device that separates those who have legitimate authority over Antarctica versus those who do not. So to in order to join the ATS, you have to demonstrate that you've conducted substantial scientific activities in Antarctica. So that is the gatekeeping device to, if you want to be part of this club versus you're excluded from this club. Um, so the conduct of science then almost becomes a platform through which competition happens, right? Competitions are happening through guns, which is good, but the competition is still happening in other ways. Um, yeah, in terms of like what I found in the archives, I guess there are fewer aha moments in the sort of archival research I do. So people were asking, or my friends were asking me, did you, did you find anything exciting in the archives? It's like, well, I'm not really looking for a smoking gun in the archives in, in, in that sense. But I think two things have stayed with me uh, through some of the archival material I looked at in um, Australia and New Zealand. And first uh, was how much insistence there was on at the creation of the ATS and the meetings that led up to it about how what they were doing was science and not politics, right? They were almost trying to depoliticize the whole thing. They're like, oh, we're just talking about science. This has nothing to do with politics, um, which I thought was inter both interesting and frustrating because for me as an analyst <laughs> reading these, these documents, I'm like, obviously this is politics. This is exactly what politics is. Um, but yeah, I've uh, reflected quite a lot about what that means for to, to almost frame science as, as an escape from politics um, and how that then perhaps comes back to bite us in the butt. Um, and then second, how histories of colonialism really shaped almost every aspect of Antarctic exploration from C Captain Cook's secret mission to find this great unknown Southern continent. And that's when he runs into you know, um, Australia and New Zealand, but also just, you know, thinking about sort of the patterns of going and pla uh, uh, flag planting, right? Like planting your flag, taking your conquest. This is how you know it's ours. It's a piece of ice. There's nobody living there besides penguins, but bam, here's the flag and it's ours, right? Like, so so that sort of logic and, um, and sort of, I mean, I, I have billed this as penguins, so I probably should say something about penguins. Yeah. Um, is yeah, it was interesting. Some of these descriptions when they first got to Antarctica and there was no people living there, the only thing they saw were penguins, they described the penguins as the indigenous inhabitants. Mm -hmm. And they basically talked about dispossessing the penguins of the land so they can conquer it for their own country, which is really interesting to think about that, that they, they would have to make these, these arguments, even jokingly. Wow, it's fascinating. And also from an IR perspective, I think Antarctica is so interesting because it's not a sovereign nation of anyone, right? That's yeah. what the Antarctic Treaty, in yes. my understanding, exactly. establishes. Puts it on ice, <laughs> freezes. Puts it on ice. So no yeah. one owns Antarctica. <laughs> Except the countries. So, so, so yeah, I think that's actually a tricky thing. It's like nobody owns it, but the countries that claim sovereignty haven't given up their sovereignty claims. Uh -huh. So it's frozen. Nobody will talks about it but they haven't said it's not theirs. Right. So so the U.S. will still say, you know, that that's, you know, the U.S. actually never made any claims, but the Australians actually are still like, oh, that, that this is this is our claim. We haven't given it up. We've just decided not to talk about it for the duration of the treaty. Uh-huh. 
I'm going to open the floor. I've asked a bunch of questions. I'll ask you to put your hands up and we're going to take a collection of, I might actually stand up to see you all, a collection of questions and we'll have several rounds. So don't worry if you don't get in the first time. Who wants to ask a first question? Yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk about it. Yeah, Dari, and if anyone's on the Zoom room, please ask questions in the Q&A box so that we can see them. Hi, I'm Dari and Amaya. Thank you so much. Um, you were talking about how science was used as a gatekeeper for the ATS, um, and I was wondering if we you see any similar things in the policy um, of, I just lost, the word was lost on me, of space. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Thank you. Start with those three questions and then, yeah. Fantastic questions, especially the first one. Um, so the the sort of, I guess, bar in which to accede to the Antarctic Treaty System, you have to conduct substantial science, um, not to get sovereignty, but to become part of the treaty system and to have a political authority of governance over this space, right? Um, so I wouldn't call it sovereignty per se, but political authority. Right. So, in fact, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of what the diplomats were concerned about when they were talking about the Antarctic Treaty System, because part of it was like, well, we can open this up to everybody. But if we opened it up to everybody, they would come and do lots of science in our territories, and then they would have claims over these territories because we based our claims over how much science and how much mapping we've done in these spaces. So we can't just open it up to everybody because we're gonna lose our sovereignty claims if everybody comes in and does science. So they were thinking sort of almost <laughs> mental gymnastics or international legal gymnastics about how to keep people out without explicitly saying they're gonna keep people out. And science is one of the ways um, that they found around it. How do we keep people, keep the, the club limited when we can't just say, <laughs> we wanna keep the club limited and doing science required infrastructure, required a history of doing science requires money. So then they're thinking, well, maybe it's just sort of hopefully it's the, the, the rich Western countries that can afford to do this. Just a quick side note. Do you want to say who is in the treaty? Like the key countries? You don't have to know them all, but like, them all. yeah. Um, so so all the in the negotiations, yeah. there were a key four. So that was the US, Britain, um, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. And they actually sat together and came up with some of the tenants before they even presented. Um, there's There were 14 at the original Washington conference, or sorry, 12 at the original Washington conference that concluded the treaty. Already it was very exclusive. India at the time actually wanted to push for Antarctica to be discussed in the United Nations so everybody can talk about it. And it was re shot down by these, these 12 countries who really wanted to keep the discussion exclusive. Um, so, so the other sort of big actors, um, Chile and Argentina, who claim uh, sections that are very similar to the British claim. Um, the, the colonial history of it comes into play. Australia and New Zealand only have claims because Britain basically gave large pieces to Australia and New Zealand and was like, do you want it? And they're like, sure. Um, and so, yeah, um, the Belgians, uh, early scientific expedition. So they were part of the... Uh, the the 12 uh the japanese also due to the early scientific exploration so you start to see scientific exploration equal some sort of political authority right um yeah so i think norwegian's always yeah yeah no that's <laughs> just to give us a flavor yeah thanks we had a second question about oh, sorry from oscar uh, exploration of americas and flag planting yes, and the similarities yes, okay. yeah yeah so i think that's a really great question 
um, about planting the flag and whether or not we can compare this to other places, whether that's in the Americas or that that's supposedly in Africa where they saw a legal terra nullius and they were like, I'm gonna plant a flag, say it's mine. Um, maybe even in um, Australia and New Zealand, they plant the flag, mine. Um, I think what's interesting about Antarctica is as you pointed out, that there's no indigenous populations to dispossess. And yet they were still doing the same sort of um, ceremonies of possession as Patri and that's Patricia Seed's um, term for it, these ceremonies of possession. And they included flag planting, which I think we're all familiar with, but also like, for example, they built these little rock towers and then they would put a proclamation into a bottle and put it there. So that was part of the ceremonies. In fact, there is an island called Proclamation Island because it's named after the act of taking possession. They put a proclamation there and then named it Proclamation Island. So it's uh, super interesting to see these ceremonies of possession played out almost on an empty stage and how the meaning almost just came from the practice of doing it rather than the actual fact of dispossessing anybody. So I think that's why Antarctica is a really interesting case of this. And last question was from Daria Spain. Gatekeeping outer space, aha. And I think, you, you know, not just outer space, I mean, yes, uh, definitely. And so I, I think I didn't answer the bit of the question you had about, uh, you know, uh, Antarctica and outer space and how they're similar. But I do think that this is, you can see similar dynamics in outer space that you become um, party to discussions of outer space and outer space governance once you're able to scientifically explore outer space. And this is why you see currently a lot of countries vying to get their rockets to, to go up there to say, oh, we, we can go to the moon, we can get into orbit, we can send a person up there. Um, that really gives them a legitimate voice then in these discussions, because if you can't send a rocket up there, you can sign as many treaties as you want about keeping the moon free, but people aren't going to listen. You're not going to have the same authority as if you can actually get a rocket up there and you can actually put a man on the moon. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, national security and environmental policy, especially uh, with China, the Chinese government trying to claim stakes of being like a near Arctic country and and building a new icebreaker and the ramifications for fishing and drilling and and trade in that area, I feel like are all very connected to national security and environmental policy. So I was just wondering what made you more drawn to Antarctica versus the Arctic Circle? Great, we had another question just here. Hello, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I would just love to learn more about the current day implications of um, the Congo Treaty and the lack of representation from the indigenous populations. And I'm especially interested how like uh, Congo Brazzaville and Congo Kinshasa are um, now able to deal with the ramifications of colonization and kind of manage um, the Congo River. Great. And got one question here and then one question there. I think my question is um, along the same lines, but uh, you talked about links between different cultural and, and social events and how you research rivers in connection to those links. And I was wondering if you, what differences were present when talking about the Congo versus the other two rivers that you research? And then I think behind you, Dan. And, um... I'm curious to learn a little bit about how your research would change if you focused on, let's say, the Nile or the Amazon River rather than the rivers that you did choose. Thank you. So back to the rivers. Back to the rivers. Back to the rivers. Actually, back to sort of um case selection, right? Yeah, Which exactly. is, <laughs> not every social scientist loves that being asked that question. Um, but actually, I think actually both of the case selection questions comes back to my focus on international treaties right so uh, the reason why i chose the danube and um the rhine and then the congo is 
the sort of how early these treaties were formed and how these commissions, how early these um, commissions were formed. Um, actually, you, you have now commissions in the Mekong uh, and commissions on the Nile based pretty much um, on these river commissions that were created in Europe, right? So again, it's a European model being taken elsewhere. Um, and uh, and I'll come back to to, to the to how it would be a different question. Um, I think with Antarctica as well, it was the following of the ATS. The, the, the Antarctic Treaty System and, um, doesn't have an equivalent in the Arctic, right? So then the question is, why is this place, space, such, such a fertile ground? It, there being nothing there, I mean, that's part of it, for this sort of cooperation. What does that cooperation mean? And sort of, um, I'm interested in sort of these geomagical, or geographical imaginaries, how we envision these spaces. And I think for me, Antarctica is really fascinating because it's almost envisioned as a state of exception where mm. everyday rules don't apply. Um, I think the, the term that I'm trying to play with is the idea of heterotopia as a space away from other spaces where different dynamics are allowed and different things might happen. And I think that's both sort of a, 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 a has utopian and dystopian potentials. Uh, so utopian being like, oh, this is, you know, we can envision Antarctica as a, a laboratory uh, where everybody, all nations come together under the banner of science. Um, but if you look at the science fiction, and I love looking at science fiction and art and all this stuff, Antarctica is oftentimes where the aliens are hidden in the ice. And when they thaw, they come and, you know, destroy Earth, right? Like, so so, so, so it's both the utopian and dystopian, like, resonances with this, that, that there's just a fear that if you thaw the ice, the aliens will come out and, you know. What, it's a good thing we have a climate scientist in the room who I think probably has been to Antarctica and tell us at some point if there are aliens under the ice. About the aliens <laughs> under the ice. All of these science fiction novels seem to, you know, be all about aliens under the ice. Um, so I think those imaginaries are interesting um, uh, for me. And this is one of the reasons why I chose Antarctica. Um, so the implications of the Berlin Conference and present day uh, politics along the Congo, yes. I think that's a great question that I can't really answer very well, um, as my research is focused on sort of the the historical aspects of of this, and I haven't actually really done a lot of research on its present day governance, um, and sort of the nitty gritty of the post colonial politics of both of the Congos. So unfortunately, I'm sorry I'm not able to 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 say much more on this. Um, in terms of differences, I think the question was about differences between the Congo, the Rhine, and the Danube in terms of the cultural and social context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, for me, the way I conceptualize these rivers, I think it's a combination of our imaginaries of the river and the river itself. And I think the two are entangled, right? So if you think about the Rhine, it's about, you know, if you think about what, what's in the, the cultural space, it's the Rhine maidens, it's the rings, it's, you know, the, there are things that we think about, but also the Rhine itself really has helped generate some of these imaginaries. So for me, these, all three rivers are different. And if I had done the Nile or the Amazon, it would be there would be totally different stories about what these rivers are. Um, and for for my book, the Rhine was very much conceived as an internal European river. So this is this is our highway. Um, uh, the Danube was conceived as sort of a, a a river that led us to the near periphery. And at the time, this is the Ottomans, right? And this is leads us to Eastern Europe, which was already already a liminal space for the Europeans. This is, you know, not quite Europe, not quite us. So sort of that identity politics is interesting. And it's a, all about um, exporting European sort of civilization to this periphery, to secure the periphery, to make sure that these dangerous ideas from the outside didn't come back down the river to get us. Um, and, and the Congo very much was about this blank space full of potential that we can civilize and that we can bring our wonderful um, organizations, institutions to. And, you know, um, and for each of these imaginaries, there was a dark side to it as well. There was insecurities, there were anxieties um, that are played out. You know, if you think about uh, a sort of Conrad's book about going up the Congo in the heart of darkness and what you find, 
there are there's a lot of cultural anxieties around sort of these positive stories of going out and making conquests. So yeah, uh, for me, I think each river, any river um, we, we might study would give us a different story due to this combination of sort of the physical characteristics of the river where it sits, where it's difficult to navigate, et cetera, and also the, then the cultural reflections on that. Any other questions? And also any questions from the Zoom uh, attendees? I'm also interested in, please type them. Uh, I can see one person in the middle, one woman there. Yeah, but they're all uh, mine. I oh. think they were about me. Um, hi, hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was really uh, fascinated by um, how uh, you mentioned that uh, the act of you know planting flags, um, despite you know there was no indigenous pop population to dispossess, this action of you know signaling um, we are possessing this this place. Um, I, I thought of it as very like performative and it kind of reminded me of modern day like wall building, like international goods don't stop by these walls, aren't stopped by these walls. Um, international organizations aren't dismantled by these walls, but this is like the signal for saying we want the globalization. And I wanted to see if like you all, uh, you had any thoughts on uh, whether the three rivers, like any part of the three rivers book also like reflected this kind of like performative, uh, especially maybe around the like Congo River. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Any other questions towards the back of the room? Yeah, there's one a guy in a green. And please remember to introduce your name so we get to know you. Hi, I'm Luciano. And I just wanted to ask if um, the all the work that you've done towards this book has helped you anyway since you started the the talk about talking about the fact that your interest in the PhD was about um the norms regulating the ocean as somebody that is interested in that i just wanted to know if they're like the all the work you've done helped has helped you in finding a way to tackle that problem or is it still like a non-resolved issue great any other questions at the back while day is at the back yeah well firstly thank you for the talk uh Can you hear it? Yeah, you can hear on the mic. It's good. Okay, can you hear me? That's fine yep. up there? Yeah. Okay. Great. So you mentioned that Australia's claim on the Antarctic uh, is sort of in a gray zone. And the way you phrased it to me implies that maybe when the trees expire, it's a bit open ended as to what will happen next. What do you think? So, when will the trees expire that you're referring to here? And what do you think will happen when they do? Great. What's going to happen to the Antarctica? Yeah. Will the aliens come out? Or might just melt first. <laughs> or it will melt first. Yeah. All right. One question here. Talk about the importance of uh, um, the exploration of Antarctica in terms of uh, tackling climate change. And hmm. where do you see it going in the future? And then I think, is it right one more or is that enough? Yeah, that's Anna Maria. Yeah, you should introduce yourself too as a new colleague. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of voice today. I'm Anna Maria Maida and I will teach some of you international economics. And my question is about economics actually. And I wonder, uh, listening to you, how much there is in what you said, this tension that exists in economics between public goods and private goods. So, you know, public goods are goods uh, uh, that can benefit a large number of people, um, but there is a big problem with free riding that nobody wants to be the one that invests to get to build those public goods. With private goods, uh, you know that if you put effort, work, uh, investment, you're gonna get the benefits out of it. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that um, in what you explained, there is uh, uh, the natural incentive um, of these countries to um, transform these lands that 
were uh, initially public goods uh, into private goods, uh, but that was also why they went there. Otherwise, they they wouldn't have gone there. So I see a lot of economics mm -hmm. um, into what happened. Great, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I'll start with some reflections. I mean, I've, I haven't framed my research in those terms, specifically public goods versus um, private goods. The way I guess my thinking around it is framed is um, sort of economic gain versus moral ideational gain. Um, and what my argument is that the two are this interconnected in the minds of the people who are interested in taking the rivers. Um, so that both the economic gain from straightening the river and making efficient commerce um, of draining the swamps and therefore making it agricultural land of uh, hardening the river banks and therefore being able to have factories right down on the river and being able to use the resources. All of these are, we can speak in the language sort of economic gain, but at the same time, when they were talking about that economic gain, it was also about a moral gain. Um, so conquest from bar uh, from barbarism or this idea that we were, you know, Frederick the Great actually said that he had conquered provinces without fighting. You know, this is the idea that is, is a moral good as well as an economic good, I think is important. So in terms of why, you know, the motivations behind why you would go and spend all this money and these efforts, to 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 make improvements, improvements, economic improvements. I think it was very much about both, and it, they're entangled because economic gains demonstrated you were a good leader, and then you had legitimacy, right? And so there was both that sort of gain internally, but also a demonstration to your peers, right? That you're a legitimate, you're a good leader. You know, you have power. So what? Right, yeah. I can think about it that way. Yeah, if that makes sense. So that's that's the way I I, I kind of saw it as the incentives. Um, uh, in terms of the flag planting being performative and its connection to wall building, I think that's such a interesting insight. I hadn't thought about um the connections to something like wall building, um, but I'll have to think about that that further because I think you're right that there is something you know also performative about building walls. Uh, does it actually, you know, stop the migrants, or is it to convey a message to your peers? Um, they did, you know, so the performative stuff. They also, I mean, they did put down stone markers, and that was how they sort of the Portuguese. If you look at their first sort of trips up and down uh, the west coast of Africa, what they did was like plant these stone markers. It's like, our land, our land, our land, which is uh, interesting in the same sort of performative um, way. And I think what's interesting about these markers is it's, it's not necessarily for the for the the indigenous Africans. It's for their peers. It's it's the communication was to other European countries that we were here first. And so you know there are always multiple audiences, I guess, for these performances. And I think it's important to ask who 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 is being spoken to. Um, who is this performance for? Um, and I think this is the crux of, well, if we think about international relations as international society, as a state, a society of states, as these states live in a, under social rules, then that performance begins to take on more or less meaning depending on who you're communicating to and what your relationship to those people you're communicating to is. So I think that is a really fundamental question. By performative, I don't want us to think that it doesn't have meaning because it could have really great meaning under the right social conditions. Um, Australia's claim uh, to, to um, Antarctica, I think what I was trying to convey was that, so there are these states in the early 20th century that made sovereignty claims. Um, on Antarctica, and for the most part, the only other states that recognized their sovereignty claims were the other people who made the sovereignty claims. Sorry, so there were it wasn't widely recognized these claims, but they still were made. Um, and this is one of the sort of reasons for conflict why a treaty was necessary, um, is to kind of um, adjudicate these claims. Now they didn't 
solve the claims, the issue of the claims, because what they decided to do was just to put it on ice you know, yes, the metaphors there, uh, is that they said, well, we're just not gonna, we're gonna freeze these claims. These claims don't go away uh, while the treaty is in force, but also we're not gonna think about them. We're not gonna talk about them, right? So it's 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 really just, you know, literally put in the freezer, I'd said, we'll, we'll worry about it another day. Um, so if the Antarctic treaty system goes away, um, then, it's anybody's guess what might happen um, in terms of making these claims. And, and there's a lot of stuff in the media about, you know, potentially, you know, the treaty terms, part of the treaty terms might be renegotiated in the coming decades. That is a potentiality, but I guess I know, I'm very cautious about making predictions about what happens. Um, there's, there's no deadline for no. an expiration because that was part of the question, no, no, I think, was no, like, no, yeah. does it expire? Like, you know. No, 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 no. Uh, maybe like a lot of things we put in the freezer <laughs> maybe we think there's no expiration date yeah no there isn't <laughs> it isn't like you know the, the 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 treaty runs out at a certain time uh there is a date that's sometimes put out 2048 i believe um where parts of the treaty can be and it's the potential can be uh put up for re renegotiation if the parties choose to uh, but that's a nitty gritty of this in the treaties. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's misinterpreted as it expires in 2048, which right. doesn't. Interesting. And there was a question related to um, oh. the uh, Antarctica's relevance oh, exactly. for climate change. Um, I think there are other people in the <laughs> room who can answer that question better than I can, the climate scientists. So I will defer to them for that. I don't know if James, you wanted to say anything on this because I feel like we are very fortunate in the room. I could just introduce briefly. Um, James Renwick is a climate scientist who's on uh, sabbatical or media air from, from uh, New Zealand. And if you want to be put on the spot and mention a couple of words, only because I was yesterday at a presentation where he talked at length about uh, the sea ice in Antarctica. So uh, what well. was yours? <laughs> Thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, and I don't know if I have any real answers to that question. It's, a, it's the question I've been thinking of today. Um, it, it's something very interesting. I, I think the, the difference between the setup of the Antarctic Treaty System, where science was used as a kind of a gatekeeper, I think that's really interesting. Whereas with climate change, it, it's almost the opposite. There's, there's no shortage of science and it's you know, supported through the United Nations and so on. But making use of the science and getting getting the action on climate change that we need, that's that's where things have fallen over. So the policy process is a bit disconnected from the science. So it's quite a different environment there. And yes, Antarctica being one of the, the most important components of the climate system in terms of ice melt and sea level rise and so on, um, must be putting pressure on the Antarctic Treaty System. And I know at recent um, Antarctic Treaty meetings, there has been, well, at least there's been pressure at those meetings to be talking about this issue and factoring those that thinking into the way the treaty evolves and so on. But it's, um, I, I'm just intrigued at how difficult a policy problem it is. And, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about the, the sort of, converse nature of climate policy versus the sort of policy around setting up something like the Antarctic Treaty System. It's a very different environment, but but related, obviously. So that's, that's it. Thanks. There was also one question um, from Luciano about oceans norms. Oh, right. Yeah. Forgot about the ocean norms. Um, Norms regulating the oceans. Yes, I think that's still a project I have yet to um, tackle. Um, but I do think, you know, when we talk about norms, sometimes we forget that it takes a long time to construct them. And that getting at the story of how norms are constructed does require sort of a long durée historical perspective, I think, in trying to dig out, you know, where did these norms come from and how in the long scheme of things, did they become so legitimate? 
Um, and I think there is a long history of engagement with the oceans, you know, all the way going back to Grotius and like trying to figure out if the oceans are, are free or they're closed. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, it is definitely an open research question and I would definitely encourage you to pursue it if you that's that's the way your interest lies. And there is already work out there on oceans, not necessarily the long durée of yeah. oceans policy. And then there's also other work on like, environmental protection as a norm so Robert Faulkner's work on thinking about states even taking it seriously that they should protect the environment that wasn't the case 100 years ago but now it is so there is other work that maybe doesn't completely fill that um, gap if you are interested why don't we take one more last round of questions I have one here which I will read out but I'll give you the opportunity in the room to ask one more last round um, so this question is um, to you, Joanne, would you argue a more like realis realist, like realism, as in the theory, would explain the Antarctic tr treaty system or a constructivist approach? So here we've got good IR theories, con mm -hmm. yeah, compare and contrast realism and constructivism in the Antarctic treaty setting. Um, you mentioned, this is Jonathan, thanks for the question, um, that th uh, the latter was your innovative approach in looking at the river commissions in the first place rather than power politics um, or sort of cooperation conflict. So he's he's curious to understand what about the, what, what in the Antarctic treaty system are states cooperating or competing is sort of part of it. So realism versus constructive. Oh. Yes, it's the same way to frame. Other questions? Anyone else? Yes. I would like to I would like to ask about the role of the science in like determining the like power of the uh how do you say setting the rules between the international corporations and things like that. So I, I would like to see it. Uh, when you do the research, do you see any kind of like a dynamics and then changings uh, compared to the history and this modern age, for example, like including Asia, for example, Japan in the kind of like a international political settings because of their emergence of their research and stuff like that? Any other questions? I have two more that I didn't get in earlier, so I might throw them in. All right, so I have one about the archival methods, because I think one thing that strikes me is that you have an interest in sort of feminist methodologies, post-colonial understanding sort of what's not being said in the record, but how do you use such an approach? Like, what does it mean to use a feminist or a post-colonial approach to studying river commissions or the Antarctic Treaty when you're looking at archives? That's one question, and the other is, what keeps you going? I mean, these are long projects that take many years. How do you keep waking up in the morning and going through all of this data? And like you said, there might not be a smoking gun moment. You might not go, oh my God, I've just understood everything. So how do you sustain it apart from ice cream? Oh, that's pretty good. Um, okay, well, thank you for, for these questions. So I guess the, the traditional realism versus constructivism um, question I don't really frame my research in this way but if pushed to shove I am of a sort of deep constructivist um uh, sort of I guess camp where <laughs> we think of as the realists are also deep down constructivist and that realism has been constructed it, it realism realists live in a world that they have constructed um to be realist so that's sort of you know I don't actually think the realists you know, under a meta theoretical constructivist framework, the realists live in the world of their own making as well. And that's a realist world. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's a cheeky answer to the realist and constructivist question. But in terms of cooperation and conflict, I don't think uh, realists have, I guess, a monopoly on conflict. Uh, you know, you can explain conflict through norms just as well as you can explain conflict through sort of material capabilities and sort of zero sum games, right? So I, in terms of the cooperation and conf, a conflict question, I don't think that's necessarily maps on neatly to a realist versus a constructivist uh, sort of um, debate. Um, I also do wanna push back against 
sort of a stark uh, cooperation versus conflict. I see the two as entangled um, in my research because you might, you might, two actors might be cooperating on one thing and, uh, you know, fighting about something else on the same day, in the same hour, in the same breath, right? Like, so I don't necessarily think that you can parse out those things because I think that dynamic, that entangled um, dynamic, the co-constitutive dynamic, if we're going to go into those constructivist terminologies, is very much there. Uh, so, you know, I do very much push back against, you know, thinking about it as purely cooperative, something as purely cooperative or purely conflictual. So when I examine something like uh, the Antarctic Treaty System or the Outer Space Treaty System, it is cooperation, but it is also conflict, right? Conflict through cooperation. There are different ways of being conflictual and cooperative at the same time. And those are the dynamics I'm really interested in teasing out. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh -huh. <laughs> in terms of sort of science and power, right? So I think this is, I and, and my thoughts are really evolving about this. This is something I really am interested in teasing out. What kind of power does sort of the recourse to science give you? Like what kind of power is that? It's some kind, of, is it just a discursive power? Is there some other sort of power that's being given sort of on an international level when you say this is objective, this is scientific? Uh, um, and that's what I'm interested in sort of distilling, because there's a long history of using scientific knowledge for all sorts of bad things and all sorts of good things, we might argue. So I am interested in teasing out some of those strands. Um, I think the history of Japan and sort of its inclusion in a, or non-inclusion in the European sort of led international system is interesting. And there's a lot that's been written about um, Japan trying to catch up, Japan trying to become a member, particularly in the late 19th century and early 20th century of a European international um, politics. And I think Antarctica was one of the ways in which they did. They were like, well, we we too want to go explore Antarctica. The Europeans can do it, we too can go and do it. And so they did send expedition when Scott and Shackleton, or Scott Shackleton and um, they were, hmm? Owenson, they were uh, competing to go to the polls. Uh, that's when the Japanese also sent an expedition. So I think that's really interesting as, as to where they saw themselves in sort of a, a, on the international stage. Um, hopefully that answers some of those questions. If not, if not come back to me. I may have misunderstood something. Uh, archival methods, I love archival methods. Um, so I don't see archives, I guess there are different ways to conceptualize archives. I don't see them as objective bodies of knowledge that you just have to read and understand, right? And so in terms of looking for strands of post-colonialism, feminism, I think sometimes it's difficult in the state archives, particularly since these are usually from the perspective of the colonizers and they tend to be the male officials of these colonizers. Um, but I think there are ways to think about archival traces of sort of um, those on the lower ends of power hierarchies. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about post-colonialism or feminism, we're looking at sort of those who may be on the lower rungs of these power hierarchies. So you, I think you can find archival traces and I think there are ways of reading into the silences. I think both of these tactics sort of aim to try to recover some sort of agency for those forgotten actors or those silence actors who are just kind of not really the protagonists of these archival records. What we are looking for are the bits that don't quite make sense, the bits that are missing, the ridges that have been smoothed over. You know, um, sometimes you use your imagination, I do think, uh, in these instances. And I think it's the same for feminist sort of approaches as um, oftentimes you're dealing with exclusion or erasure. How do you then in, um, recover uh, voices that have been left out? Um, in Antarctica, I think it's really interesting, right? Like women's role in Antarctica is super fascinating, right? Um, in the Scott archives in Cambridge, there are traces of these women who actually applied to Shackleton to go on his expedition. He sent out a call saying like any if, uh, any men, he said men who, who wanted to come on the expedition, please apply to my expedition. And these women wrote and were like, we are also, you know, adventurous girls and we also want to come. And they were rejected because they were girls. Uh, but it's interesting to see those traces, right? Like to say, okay, well, you know, may maybe there were women who wanted to go. Um, Antarctic explorers also discussed women in the absence. So this is, you know, interesting, I think, 
uh, much like if you think about war and how women are framed in war, um, they're adored in the absence and they're kind of, um, uh, men wanted to kind of be worthy and prove themselves so that they can return home uh, to some sort of idyllic home life. Um, but in Antarctica too, what I think was interesting is there's a celebration um, of the lack of women, a sense of this Peter Pan-esque sort of camaraderie untainted by the, 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 the other sex and that they can like do whatever they want and sort of a, a return to boyhood, which, you know, is actually interesting to think, a way to think about sort of what these men were doing in Antarctica. Um, but I also think that through art, through fiction, you know, some, sometimes we can envision things. Uh, for example, the, the fiction of Ursula Le Guin, for me, has, has done a lot. She's, she's written a, a short story called Sir. Um, I think she, it's published in 1982, uh, where she envisions that the first people who get to the South Pole are these women, this group of women um, from Chile and Argentina. Uh, and she basically rewrites the story of polar exploration through the eyes of these women. And what's really interesting about this short story, and I really highly recommend anybody who's interested, please do read it, it's, it's fascinating, is that these women are uh, obsessed with not leaving a trace because they think that the men who come after them would be heartbroken if, if they knew that somebody else had came before them. So they were like, we're just not gonna leave a trace so that the men can have their glory too. Fascinating, right? So absolutely. So also, I think there are lots of just um, interesting tactics you can use in the archives and ways, different ways of reading the material. Um, what keeps me going? Oh, we'll end on that. Okay, what keeps me going? I guess it's not really knowing what's next. So I don't think I would be as interested in these projects if I was the type of social scientist that set up an experiment and know exactly every step of the research I do. I think I personally would be bored by that. Um, what I enjoy the most is sort of not knowing what I'm gonna find going into the archives or going into sort of literature or cultural artifacts and just immersing myself and then developing theoretical insights from that. Uh, because I think it leads me to all sorts of places I hadn't been, wouldn't have predicted before I started. And it's, it's almost like an adventure, right? Yeah. And so I think that's what keeps me going in sort of the 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 long trudge of research. Um, but I I think it's it's so much fun. It's such a privilege to be able to to do this for a living. Um, and I guess that's why I'm an academic. Awesome. I think it's a great, great last note to end on. So a big warm thank you. And um, I would recommend that for those of you who are interested in those rivers, you can, if it's your, you know, here in Europe and you're not normally based in this part of the world, get a train and you can go along the Rhine. There's a great river you can take. You done that? <laughs> yeah, if you go to... Basel, Basel, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Basel. In the summer, you can actually go get in the river and float down. They like everybody just swims down the river. And you can cycle along the Danube. I've done sections of that. So you can get to know the rivers yourself while you're here, bike and train. Um, but more generally, for all of you students, do come along to, well, for anyone in the room, come along to next Monday and next Thursday. We have great lineup of um, seminar sessions. On Monday, we'll have a faculty panel on the Middle East with our very own Rafaela del Sarto, who will speak Israel-Palestine. Liesl Hintz, who's an expert on Turkey and can speak beyond that region. Of course, the Turkish election happened this year. Um, and it will be moderated, as I understand, by Sergei Rodchenko. So that should be an excellent event. And keep an eye out on your emails, and Susanna and Dea will communicate further events. They're generally held here. So that's, if you're wondering where it is, unless you hear otherwise, that's the general rule of thumb. Monday at 6.30 p.m. in the evening, and Thursdays in this 3.30 slot. So thanks all for coming, and enjoy the rest of your first week at SAIS. Cheers.